The reality is if you try this, you'll notice when you're walking, it pulls on, on especially the suspensory ligament when, you, when your leg goes backwards, but then there's no tension when it goes forwards. This is horrible. Good morning, friends. I wish you guys a wonderful Saturday. Today I'm here to talk to you guys about something a little bit odd. It's about the practice of male circumcision and how I uncircumcise myself and how you can too by following the guidelines I describe in this video. Before we get into the video, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, like the video and comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. Now let's get started. First of all, it's interesting to compare female circumcision to male circumcision in terms of its acceptance in society. Female circumcision seems to be just as old as male circumcision. The earliest evidence of female circumcision comes from ancient Egypt, like the earliest evidence of male circumcision. But for some reason, female circumcision is treated in a much more uh, antagonistic way by society. It's seen as abuse generally, while male circumcision is not frequently seen as abuse. And this is odd to me. So for example, where do you see female circumcision going on in the world today? In developing countries, in obscure developing countries, oftentimes in the continent of Africa. And it is illegal to circumcise a minor female in the US, and it is illegal for an American family to circumcise their minor female outside the US. It's actually illegal. Whereas it's not illegal to circumcise a male child. And the antagonism towards female circumcision compared to male circumcision goes even a step further. If you want to learn about male circumcision on Wikipedia, if you search circum male circumcision on Wikipedia, you find a page called circumcision. If you search for female circumcision on Wikipedia, you find a page called female genital mutilation. Not male genital mutilation, just the female one. Now, they, 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 some people do refer to male circumcision as male genital mutilation, but it's quite rare compared to the female side. Now, you might be wondering, why is this all happening? Why is the female uh, circumcision so unaccepted and the male circumcision so accepted? Is it because they're, the, the female circumcision damages the woman more? That's true in the case that they remove the clitoris. Some of the female circumcision actually remove the clitoris. Some remove the hood of the clitoris, similar to a man's foreskin being removed. Removed. and some remove the labia in either inner or outer sort of similar to the man's foreskin being removed so some of the kinds of female circumcision are a bit similar to the male circumcision but treated much more society responds against it and protects young females from it whereas young men are not being protected the earliest depictions as i mentioned earlier of male circumcision were from ancient egypt and it's believed that the ancient egyptians and other north africans may have influenced the semites the semites are phoenicians jews arabs a group of people that speak a related language group called the semitic languages judaism instituted a mandatory circumcision in the tanakh which is the old testament in christianity and the tanakh God demands that Abraham circumcise himself and his whole family as a covenant, or not his whole family, but his male members of his family as a covenant to God. But interestingly, the relationship between Abraham and the Jewish God in the Jewish religion is somewhat tumultuous. There's another example where the Jewish God asked Abraham to kill his own son. And then right before he kills the son, he basically says, hey, I was just testing you, I'm just kidding. So there's a little bit of an odd relationship there. But that seems to be where Judaism instituted the mandatory circumcision. Although there are reports that some uh, Jewish prophets like Moses himself were not circumcised. Moving away from Judaism for a bit, with the advent of Christianity, something very interesting happened. After uh, Jesus of Nazareth died, his brother James took over his church. It is said and believed by uh, scholars such as Riz Aslan that when James took over the church, he maintained the Jewish traditions, meaning that people who followed Jesus, the Messiah, had to still circumcise themselves and so on. On the other hand, there was another person who followed Jesus called Paul, originally called Saul. That was his Jewish name, he changed it to Paul. Paul never met Jesus and therefore probably knew him less than his brother James. But Paul removed the mandatory requirement of circumcision to the people he preached to. And in particular, Paul tended to preach to the Eastern Roman Empire, including the Syrian Arabs in that area, many of whom at the time did circumcise. But in the end, now in modern times, those Syrian Arabs that are Christians are mostly uncircumcised and most Christians are uncircumcised. And the reason mainly seems to be because of Paul. In fact, there is some evidence that James, the brother of Jesus, actually admonished Paul for foregoing the Jewish practices, but Paul seems to have gotten away with it anyway. Today, the religions most associated with male circumcision are Islam and Judaism. It skipped a generation with Christianity because of the help of Paul. But in Islam, when the Prophet Muhammad began to preach to the people of Mecca, it was known that the people of Mecca and Medina 
Frequent, the, the Arabs of Mecca and Medina already practiced female and male circumcision. In fact, the Arabs of the Nabatean Kingdom in modern-day Jordan did as well. In Islam at the moment, there's a disagreement among the scholars and the, what they call the four madhahab, the four Sunni schools of thought about jurisprudence. There's disagreement whether male circumcision is mandatory or recommended. In general, historically, Bedouin Arabs, of which I descend from, for example, in the UAE, tended to get circumcised between the ages of 7 and 10. That's what happened to my father. So he remembers the horrific incident where someone stole a piece of his body. In my case, I, because I was born in the United States, I was circumcised at birth, which is unusual, in our culture at least. Or, it's not unusual anymore, but it was unusual in those times. Now, how do you uncircumcise yourself? Well, you can't exactly uncircumcise yourself. What you can do is try to stretch your skin on your penile shaft to become longer and long enough that it eventually uh, tightens around the end and becomes some kind of foreskin. It won't be as good as having a foreskin originally, but I can tell you from personal experience, it may dramatically enhance your sensitivity during sex and absolute pleasure that you experience during orgasm. Because if you think about it, walking around without a foreskin all day, your glands, the most sensitive part of your sexual organ, similar to a woman's clitoris, is just rubbing against fabric all day. This is just constantly desensitizing it. It's just crazy how much of a difference it makes when that doesn't happen. But let me tell you a little bit about the, the history of this. Interestingly, in Roman times, about the first century AD was the first time people uh, we know of tried to restore foreskin. They were doing it surgically because at the time, it seems that the Jewish practice of cutting off the foreskin was limited to whatever skin went past the glands. It was a minor uh, circumcision. It seems later that they enhanced the circumcision to prevent people from being able to undo it. But that didn't quite work. Let me tell you how it doesn't work. So first of all, the main device you need to do this really efficiently is called an all-day stretcher. I'll tell you guys about that in a second. But before I do, I want to talk about pumping. I believe that pumping, vacuum pumping, water vacuum pumping, using the LA pump, I don't believe that the bath mate works quite as well, but I'm not sure yet. I actually got one recently to test it out, but I did develop all of my practice on the LA pump, and there's a, gonna be a link to it on the comment section below and on my website. So there's a kind of pump, I have two videos on pumping. What's interesting about pumping is this. Normally when you pump, you want to maintain your erection throughout the whole time you're in the pump. If you don't, you won't benefit from it. You won't grow as much, you won't produce as much angiogenesis, the birth of new blood vessels. Sort of like what happens when you use minoxidil in your hair. So you have to remain erect the whole time. The second thing is you can't stay in the pump for too long. If you stay over like 30 minutes or so, what then begins to happen, whether you're flaccid in the pump or stay too long, is you begin to develop lymphatic fluid that basically goes in underneath your skin and in your skin. So you get like a fat skin around your penis and the skin sort of stretches, especially usually around the circumcision scar, interestingly, if you're uh, circumcised. So when you do this, what happens is the skin really stretches. Now, this is actually a sort of a porn star trick. You'll see many times, sometimes porn stars have surgeries that make their penises look like that, but oftentimes they go and pump for an hour and a half or something before they have sex on camera to cause this excess lymphatic fluid, which can increase the girth by half an inch to an inch immediately within an hour or so, but it's not real girth. So some people do this to trick people or, or on porn and stuff like that. What I discovered by doing this accidentally, because early on we didn't know how long we should stay in the cylinder. So we experimented with very lengthy times, over hours and hours. When I did that, I discovered that when my penis would fill up with lymphatic fluid, the skin would stretch dramatically. I noticed I got the most stretching of the skin from that. Once the skin, if you're over circumcised like they do to many of us, you need to loosen the skin enough so that you can stretch it a little bit past the glands while it's flat, fully extended flaccid, ideally. If it's fully extended flaccid, you can pull the skin a little bit past the glands, you're ready to use the all-day stretcher. You'll get to that point using the pump. And you can use the pump and the all-day stretcher like in different times of the day or every other day at the same time. They don't uh, counteract in a way like hanging and pumping does. Next is the topic of the all-day stretcher. I actually wanted to make a separate video on how to use uh, all-day stretchers as I have a lot of experience with them. I know what they're good for and what they're not good for and people mislead people a lot online about what they are good for. But I haven't found a good all-day stretcher currently on the market that I want to recommend to you guys because I don't, I don't know any of those currently being produced. The people I knew used to produce them before with the same styles uh, are not producing them anymore. But let me tell you what they are even though I can't recommend an individual one. This device is meant to be a device that stretches out your penis past its maximum flaccid length throughout the day so that over time you could potentially gain some kind of 
uh, length in the actual shaft of the penis, okay? The reality is you can't gain real length in the shaft of the penis, so this is really not very useful, uh, wearing it like all day in your pants. It's not really useful, because if you do that, you'll basically what happens is the device looks like this. There's a cap. This cap goes on the end of your penis. It's a short cap that's usually see-through. You don't want to get too big of a cap, because if you do, it'll be almost like you're vacuum pumping the glands of your penis, which will cause, by the way, the glands to get bigger unusually. It's happened to me before. So you need the right size. And then what happens is there's a silicone sleeve, a long silicone sleeve. You take that sleeve and put it on the cap and then you roll it backwards. So now if you put the cap on your penis, you can roll the sleeve back on the penis and, and it's stuck there. At the end of the cap, there's usually a metal like circle to which is attached some kind of like spandex, kind of like stretchy rope. And then that rope is attached to a leg harness. Now, traditionally, you would wear this leg harness around your knee and you would wear, you would have your dick on one side of your pants. You'd be walking around all day like that. The reality is if you try this, you'll notice when you're walking, it pulls on, on especially the suspensory ligament when, you, when your leg goes backwards, but then there's no tension when it goes forwards. This is horrible. This can cause your penis actually to become more resistant to stretching. So this is not even useful. What is useful is that Instead of wearing it all day, if you, if you attach that knee harness or leg harness to your ankle instead and sit down like while watching TV with, you know, just relaxing, you can have your penis pointing somewhat down toward your ankle and that can stretch the suspensory ligament similar to how hanging does. In fact, that is the best way, in my opinion, to solidify gains from hanging. But anyway, that's, I just want to describe how this goes. Now, to do this, to stretch out your skin, all you have to do is before you put your penis in the cap, you pull your penis out fully and stretch out the skin as far as you can on the glands. And when you put the cap in and roll the sleeve back holding the penis, the, the skin will stick there. So if you then attach the end of it to your ankle and stretch it out, you're stretching the skin directly. You're stretching the skin as much as you're stretching the penis. This will cause it to grow quite quickly. I got to a point where eventually it was going over the full glands. And so therefore what I did was I found a kind of tape that I could use temporarily while using the device to keep it around the glands and keep it closed, the foreskin part. So eventually you can grow it a lot. Now I haven't done this for years. And it did go backwards. It did like uh, recede to some degree, but it's still half there. So this is years later. So th this shows that there, these are permanent effects. And by the way, I could have pursued it further at the end and I bet it would have been there fully. I just got a little busy with my life and stopped wearing that stuff. But you can easily regrow it. Now, what I want to highlight to you guys is this is not an aesthetic decision. This is a practical decision. First of all, for people who are overly circumcised, for example, if you're with a woman and she grabs the shaft and moves it too quickly, you'll get hurt. I won't get hurt because I've done this. Second of all, you, uh, if you're still circumcised, on a daily basis, you're getting desensitized on your glands. If you think that's not true, if you think it, you just got desensitized in the past and it can't come back, then how did we and me and many others regain some sensitivity of our, of our glands after regrowing the foreskin? Not all of us, I mean, we didn't get all the sensitivity back for sure. I, this is incomparable to someone who was never mutilated in the first place. But uh, for me, my sensation sometimes like almost doubled. So it's a massive benefit. If you're someone who enjoys sex, this is a massive benefit and something worthwhile doing. I hope this video was informative for you guys and easy to understand. If you want to find an all-day stretcher before I find one I can recommend to you guys, which by the way, if you find good ones, send me a message about it, let me know, and I'll contact the, the company and get one of the products to try it myself. But uh, at the moment, if you go into Google Images and search uh, penis all-day stretcher or just all-day stretcher silicon sleeve, or all day stretcher vacuum silicon. You'll find pictures of the device that I'm describing, made by probably different suppliers. You could try a couple of them and figure out which one works for you. Anyway guys, I wish you have a great Saturday and I hope to see you soon.